This is a show that brings to the forefront newsmakers, entertainers, and those making a difference in our lives and in our world. Each week is a new adventure with topics ranging from the most serious and cutting edge to the most lighthearted and entertaining. This is Taking Care of Business with Richard Solomon. Greetings, everyone. Richard Solomon from My Father's Place Radio. And I have an unbelievable guest this week. Okay, so Lawrence Welk sort of said that this this person sang gospel music on his show. So, so is there any truth to the rumor to that? By the way, this is well, Michael Brewer, Brewer and Shipley. Well, it's gospel to us. <laughs> exactly. So 52 years. 52 yeah. years. Unbelievable. When you look in the rearview mirror, does it feel like five minutes? Yes. Time flies when you don't know what you're doing. Well, let's talk about what you're doing today. All right, so so you're you're still touring. Uh, you did a gig not that long ago at my father's place in Roslyn, and we're going to have another uh, chance to get to see you uh, live uh, at, in Roslyn, Long Island, uh, in August of nineteen. Uh, in case this is viewed past that, at least this will be an archive that we could use in the future. But so, what what is it like touring now as opposed to then? Is it more luxurious, or is it still just a lot of schlepping? Well, there's a lot of schlepping. In fact, after the past weekend with the air travel from hell that Tom Shipley and I ended up going through, we've decided after this East Coast tour, we're not going to fly anymore. So it's just, just become too hard. Air travel just gets worse and worse and worse. Not to mention the fact that we're in our 70s and, you know, lugging guitars and suitcases and T-shirts, bags and stuff like that. You have to walk miles and miles. I swear to God, in we were in Minneapolis this past weekend. We walked so many miles just getting two baggage claim. And then to get the rental car, more miles and escalators and elevators and trams. Uh, and then more miles <laughs> to get to the rental car place. And then leaving, I have never seen more people, Richard, going through security at 8 o'clock in the morning hundreds of people with, you know, drug dogs and things. So, no, it's not what it used to be. Uh, it used to be able to actually fit into a seat on an airplane. <laughs> I just thought I just, you know, I was just eating too many potato chips. <laughs> yeah. At least for yeah, me. Yeah, you could fit in a seat. You could smoke. If you were a smoker, they fed you. You could go back in the bathroom and, and burn one if you wanted <laughs> to, you know. But not anymore. I, I remember when you could actually take a nap across the three seats because the plane wasn't packed. Yeah. Remember those days? Get a little oh, blanket, yeah. kind of just curl up, and three hours later, wake up, you're at your destination, and uh, you didn't need to get one of those fancy first-class you know, beds or whatever for $3,000 or whatever. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, those days are long gone, I'm afraid. So are you going to do the bus thing or, or the, the Winnebago? I don't know what we're going to do. We <laughs> may just end up playing regionally gigs that we can drive to because we've just had it with air travel. I mean, it was a nightmare this past weekend. I'll give you a quick synopsis. I showed up at the airport at turning in the rental car at 8 o'clock. Hours later, after going through security, and of course I had to go through Chicago to change planes. Weather in Chicago, that's that's my nemesis because we live in the Ozarks. Tom usually flies out of St. Louis. I fly out of Springfield, Missouri. I always have to go through Chicago, my least favorite airport. Tom and I joked years ago when we lived in Kansas City and had to go through Chicago that we, at one point we thought about having our, getting our wives' jobs at the coffee shop because we'd get to see them more often. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, hours later, finally, they, I got on a flight to Chicago, got to Chicago. Hours and hours later, finally got on a flight to Springfield, Missouri, well, in flight, all the cabin pressure went away. They had to drop 10,000 feet in seconds. The oxygen mask didn't even drop, and the AC went out. We had to make an emergency landing in Moline, Illinois. And by the time we landed, it had to be, oh, I'm guessing 85, 90 degrees on the plane. <laughs> People thought they were going to faint. It was ridiculous. So we get into the little tiny Moline airport. And the AC felt wonderful. Well, hours and hours later, we were all freezing to death. We couldn't go outside. We couldn't leave. We couldn't go anyplace because our boarding passes 
weren't valid in Moline, <laughs> Illinois. And well, it was a Sunday in a tiny airport, so there was nothing to eat. The only thing there was was a tiny little, one of those little places that sells magazines and and chips and candy. That was it. So we waited for hours. A plane coming in from Denver. We were hoping it was going to fly, fly us on home, or fly me on home. Tom had gone through uh, St. Louis. I'm headed to uh, Springfield. Well, that one landed. We couldn't use it because it had exactly the same problem. Wow. So hours later, the last chance we had was the last flight coming into that airport. And uh, we managed to get on that. They had to rush us on board. The pilot told us that, according to the FAA, he's only allowed so many hours a day to pilot a plane. So we had to get in the air immediately, or we were going to have to spend the night in Moline, Illinois. So we managed to get in the air, and finally, I finally got to Springfield, Missouri, got my car, drove home. So I started out at 7 o'clock in the morning and got home at 1 a.m. the next morning. That's a long day. Yeah. That's a long day. And Tom, who landed in St. Louis, he hadn't even made it out of St. Louis. He saw weird things happening in the traffic ahead of him, and uh, all of a sudden there was a car headed straight at him. Somebody had sideswiped a car, flipped it around, so they had a head-on collision at 50 miles an hour. His car is totaled. Fortunately, he's not hurt. So that August 11th, 2019, might have been the luckiest day Brewer and Shipley have ever had. Wow. Well, I didn't go down in a plane, and he didn't get killed in a car wreck. Well, so we're not I expect to fly to keep, anymore. I expect to keep hearing great music from you guys, so please, you know. <laughs> you know, my latest solo CD has a song on it called I Don't Like to Fly Anymore. <laughs> well, it pretty much says it all. So, We're not doing it anymore. We're, it's, we've had it. We're not going to fly anymore. So while you did fly, what did you actually do to protect your precious equipment? Because you, well, know, you, you can't be hugging your guitars <laughs> you know, in your seats. They don't fit in the overheads. What, what did you do to keep all your equipment safe? Well, you know, I got tired. We lived in Kansas City, and TWA was based out of there. I got tired of them breaking my guitar. So I paid a lot of money in 1970, whatever it was for uh, this big anvil case, coffin-shaped case, really elaborate, had a humidity gauge in it and everything. The very first flight I put it on, TWA broke the neck. Wow. Even, so does that answer your question? Even we with tried the... a valet check them, you know, but that's part of the problem. You know, walking for miles through airports carrying our damn guitars is just so hard because we're in our 70s, and... Uh, and then they end up, you get to the gate to try to valet check it, and they say, no, we can't valet check this flight, so they check it anyway. So, you know, when you get to where you're going and you hope that your guitar and your bag shows up, then you check your guitar and hope that it's not broken. So That's... air travel, forget it. I'm done with it. It sounds so stressful. I mean, would it, would it it's pay... unbelievably stressful, man. It's just ridiculous. Almost every time we have to fly someplace, we go through this kind of crap, and it's just... You know, we've done it for so long, and it just gets worse and worse and worse, not to mention the price of a plane ticket, too. And and if you have to kill time in an airport, I bought a, a vodka cranberry. cost $12.50. <laughs> I mean, I can't think of anything pertaining to air travel that, uh, you know, is positive. Nothing. Well, well. For for those of us who are still lucky to see you while you do travel, especially like to Roslyn, uh, what, what is what is like the the great backstory of my father's place to you? Because you've played the old place, oh, and many then, times. And then and then one of the things that you said on your last show at my father's place was uh, was it you or was it Tom? Some somebody put on their glasses and said, "Oh my God, I see all these old people." <laughs> That's Tom. Yeah, Tom wears glasses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what was yeah. it like playing in the old club? Was it was it well organized? How was the sound? And how uh, the was sound it? was always good, okay. and we always had a good time. It was always, you know, a raucous place. We had a lot of fans show up. Gosh, we had people, you know, we made a bunch of friends playing the bitter end in, in uh, Greenwich Village who from Brooklyn who just, you know, became major fans. It was a big deal for them. It was like leaving leaving the state or something to them to go out 
<laughs> to Long Island to come and see us. They felt like they were, you know, a foreign land or something. You know, so far. But uh, yeah, they would come to see us, and uh, yeah, we always had a good time. In fact, there are a whole, uh, more times than not we had a, a band in those days, and uh, there are all kinds of bootleg recordings of us from my father's place on YouTube and and even on our website at BrewerShipley dot com. I would like to tell people they should check out our website at BrewerShipley dot com because there's there's more information about us than anybody would even want to know because we have one one hell of a uh, webmaster. Well, so we had a great time. We always had a good time playing my father's place, and uh, we didn't know what to think a couple of years ago when we played the new one at the Roslyn Hotel in uh, in Roslyn. And it's a wonderful old hotel, and the venue downstairs is just beautiful. It's like a dinner theater, really good sound and stage. We had a ball. We really enjoyed it a lot. It was great seeing Epi again after all those years. Yeah, he's he's up there too. <laughs> I guess everybody grew up together, you know. Yeah, we're all geezers. <laughs> But but think of it this way, I don't I don't think any of you guys are golfers, so you know this is what no, you guys get to do. So yeah. Plus, not only that, can you imagine the trauma of traveling with golf clubs? <laughs> oh Lord. Well, Tom is an avid fly fisherman, so if he's going any place that there might be some place close by, he always takes along a a retractable uh, fly rod. In fact, I'll... that makes me think of uh, well several times actually, but. There's a tour that we've done numerous times. It's all over the the uh, Northwest, uh, you know, Idaho and Montana and Wyoming, and, and it ends with five shows in Alaska. And uh, but at one particular dip before going to Alaska, we had five days to kill. So again, with air travel it's so hard because we live in the Ozarks in southern Missouri, so it's not easy to you know come and go. We don't have major airports. So instead of going through all the hassle of flying home and then you know being home for like a day and having to turn right around and do it again, we just decided to stay in Jackson Hole, which was the last show we did before going to Alaska. So we made it really obvious on stage, you know, we sure would like to go fish and we got to kill a few days. Well, after the show, back at the motel in the, in the bar, some Wyoming cowboy—he looked like a classic. Looks like one of those. Cowboys, you see, you know, a, a silhouette cowboy with a straw sticking out of his mouth, that kind of thing. He looked just like one of those. And he came up to me and he says, are you incognito? And I said, no. He said, are you serious about wanting to go fishing? I said, absolutely. Well, that turned out to be cool because he was the foreman of a ranch, not 10 minutes outside of Jackson Hole, 8,000 8, acre ranch bordering wow. Harrison Ford's 8,000 acre property with three native streams fl- flowing through, going into the Snake River. Tom just happened to have a little ultralight along with his uh, fly rod. So we got to go fishing for several days in a row on this this wonder place outside of Jackson Hole with herds of elk running around. And oh, it was just wonderful. There were cutthroat trout that had never seen a lure or a fly. So just pretty much every cast, you know, we were, we were catching some really sizable, nice fish. It was beautiful. And it's the only time in my entire life I've had a game warden tell me, well, you better keep keep your eyes open because the grizzlies are waking up and they're hungry and in a bad mood. <laughs> so, so, so that turned out to be pretty cool. So speaking of neighbors and property, I, I, I understand you kind of were neighbors with Jim Messina and some other really cool people. Oh, yeah. Well, we lived in Hollywood. Could you talk about uh, that for a little bit? Because I, sure. I, I heard you mention that on stage at the last performance. And I thought that was really interesting about all the people you kind of know. Yeah. Well, you know, we've been around a long time, so we've crossed paths with many, many artists. But uh, I got to L.A. a year or so before Tom did back in the 60s. And, in fact, I had a partner before Tom, a guy named Tom Maston. We'd written some songs together and uh, decided to go to California to see if we could get something going. And we did. We landed a record deal. With, we recorded a three-song demo and uh, landed a record deal with Columbia Records. And we put together a band. Our bass player was Jim Messina, who went on to be with Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Our drummer was uh, Billy Mundy, who went on to be with Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention and Rhinoceros and various other supergroups. And uh, <clears throat> there was a house next door to me. I was living on a street called Fountain Avenue. and. Uh, this guy named Barry Friedman, who lived next door, worked for the Randy Sparks organization, and, and uh, he's the guy who actually recorded our demo and got us the deal with Columbia. Anyway, he 
way, we, uh, Tom Mass and I were living next door to him, and our band was rehearsing, and his place was a busy corner. There were always musicians coming and going and crashing on his floor and rehearsing or whatever. And there was this one uh, brand-new band, bunch of guys rehearsing next door. If they weren't next door, they were at our house. And uh, Fountain Avenue was being widened at the time. And uh, one night, Barry Friedman and one of the guys in the band, Neil Young, <laughs> came walking in and said, Hey, man, look, uh, there was a big, every night there'd be a big vehicle uh, parked out front because the road was being widened. And he said, uh, Hey, man, look what we just stole off that thing in front of your house. We're going to name the band this. And they held up an iron plaque that read Buffalo Springfield. Oh. So the Buffalo Springfield and our band. Ended up uh, going on tour opening for the Birds when Eight Mile High was their current single. And the Buffalo Springfield and our band were headlining, co billing, I should say, at the Whiskey A Go Go for a solid week. So we had everything going our way. But Tom Maston was a tormented soul and he couldn't handle the pressure, so he quit. Well, our guy at Columbia was leaving to go to a brand new record label by uh, formed by Herb Alpert and Jerry Moss called AM Records. So he took me under his wing and signed me as a staff songwriter for one of their publishing companies. About that time, Tom came to town and ended up, and we knew each other from the folk days, traveling the folk circuit. We'd done some hanging out and stuff, and had already become friends. So he came to town, and he just ended up moving into a house right around the corner from me, which was, in fact, next door to Jim Messina. Jim, of course, was a musician, but he was earning his living as a recording engineer at the time. So he became a staff songwriter as well, and we started hanging out and writing songs. And uh, we would go into the studio to record demos on our songs to, for the record company to pitch to other artists. So we got some cuts. But our demo, they were really impressed by our demos because they sounded more like records than demos. And we had a thing happening with our vocals that they thought was unique. So they said, well, why don't you guys record your own songs? So we did. We ended up recording an album entitled Down in L.A. That was our first album on A&M Records. We hadn't even planned to be a duo. You know, we were just songwriters. And uh, so we recorded our first album, and that was the beginning of Brewer and Shipley. Wow. And uh, we were working with some great musicians. We knew they were really talented, but we were so naive, we didn't have a clue. It was the Wrecking Crew. <laughs> you know, it was playing on everybody's record. And uh, so it pretty, turned out pretty pretty good. Oh, it turned out great. Let me put you, hold you right there. This is Richard Solomon with Michael Brewer, Brewer and Shipley. We'll be back right after this. Keep it locked in. I'm Sherman Arnowitz. I'm Mark Brenner. We're from Vista Hill. And you're, and you're listening, listening to, to Richard, Richard Solomon on WCWP 88.1 FM. All right, Richard Solomon, My Father's Place Radio, Michael Brewer of Brewer and Shipley. And we had to take a quick break, but he was in the middle of a great set of stories. So why don't we just go back to where you left off and, and talk about uh, the Brewer and Shipley. And, and you're, I think this was A&M or A&M Records, by the way, right? Right. Okay, yeah. so... And by the way, I should say that Down in L.A. has finally been released <laughs> in in the U.K. But you can find it on Amazon. It's been digitally remastered. And it sounds very 60s, but I have to say it holds up. Oh, another point of interest. Down in L.A. was one of the very first stereophonic sound records ever released. How how bizarre is that? Wow. Now, everything I'm... we take so for granted today with you know digital technology and everything. Wow, it wasn't that long ago. Stereo was brand new. John Denver told me one time that he used to use down in L.A. to demonstrate stereo because we really utilized it. We made things go back and forth, so, you know, listen to it with headphones on was the cool way to listen to it. And he told me that, you know, friends would sit around with headphones and pass a bowl and uh, listen to stereo. So I have to ask, way back, you know, everybody in those days had, like, certain kinds of stereo components they had like the Technics turntable. They had like uh, Marantz equalizers. They had like the Harman Kardon speakers. What was your stereo array? And, and Lord, I have no idea. I just put on a record and listened to it. I don't know. I'm not a high tech guy. In fact, my first solo CD is called Retro Man. I am a retro man. Do, do you miss vinyl? Speaking of retro, oh my God, yes. I'll take vinyl any day. I'm glad to see that it's making a comeback. 
it sounds way better to me. Analog recording and, and vinyl sounds way better to me than digital. You know, it's way more human. I don't have any problem hearing a, a finger squeak on a guitar, you know, or hearing somebody take a breath. Uh, you know, that's, that, that's the humanness of it. And that's what's missing in music today to me. So I'm, I'm glad it's making a comeback. In fact, just a couple of years ago, one of my grandkids wanted a turntable for Christmas. So we got him a turntable, and I gave him a Brewer and Shipley record. It's his first ever <laughs> stereophonic sound album on vinyl to listen to. But anyway, to continue with the story I was telling you about, Tom and I both, you know, had been performers in the, the playing the folk circuit for years, and we missed performing. So we would, uh, just for the fun of it, we'd go to a place called the Troubadour, I'm sure everybody's heard of, in, yes. in Hollywood. On Monday nights, it was Hoot Nanny Night, they called it, and you paid your dollar, and if you got to go on, then at the end of the night, you got your dollar back. And it, we'd get up there and, you know, sing the few songs that we'd written just for fun, and uh, it would be people like uh, Linda Ronstadt and people who went on to be the Eagles and, and uh, gosh, just, you know, for group after group, Arlo, Guthrie, and Jackson Brown at like 16 years old. In fact, we had to give him a hard time because he had written uh, These Days, and there's a line in it, you know, uh, don't, uh, what is it, something, not condemned, don't, something, don't confront me with my failures. I've not forgotten them. And we say, Jackson, you're 16 years old. How many, <laughs> how many failures could you have had in your 16 years? But anyway, we'd play at the Troubadour and any place we could. But we didn't like living out there. That's why we named it Down in L.A. I should also talk more about the recording. We ended up uh, recording half of it at Leon Russell's home studio. Leon was one of the guys in the Wrecking Crew. So he played all the keyboard on it, and we recorded it at his home studio. But we didn't like it, so we did it the hard way. We, just about the time the album was finished, we decided to leave and take our chances. And uh, Tom's rent ran out before mine did, so he sort of camped in my backyard for a couple of weeks. And then he went on to the Hopi Reservation in Arizona. And he called me at one point and said that the Hopi were having their annual snake dance. They dance every day. It's part of their culture and, and spirituality. And the snake dance is like really highly regarded because, uh, gosh, the, the elders go down into the, the kivas and spend weeks on end, taking all kinds of mescaline and and peyote and cleansing snakes that they've brought in from the desert. Then they come out and dance around in the town square with live rattlesnakes, and then they release them back to the to the desert to thank the Great Spirit for allowing them to grow corn where they don't get nearly enough rain to grow corn. And he says, "Man, that's happening. You got to you got to make it here." So. I'd already gotten rid of everything in my place, except for a mattress on the floor. The last thing I had to do was go get uh, some new tires for my 1957 Volkswagen that I had at the time. And on the Pasadena Freeway, I came around the curve, and traffic was stopped, so I had to slam on the brakes. Somebody in a little sports car going too fast rear-ended me. And of course, the engine is in the back of a Volkswagen. So I had two more weeks in an empty house, <laughs> twiddling my thumbs waiting to get that repaired and eventually escaped L.A. and uh, drove for 30-something hours and rendezvoused with Tom at, on a flat-top mesa in the middle of nowhere on the Hopi Reservation in Arizona and saw the snake dance. And we had one gig booked in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We went, and I'm from Oklahoma City. Tom's from Ohio, the, the Cleveland area. Uh, we went to Oklahoma City, Tom camped in my folks' backyard for a couple of days, and then we went on to Tulsa, and they canceled on us when we got there because we were hippies and singing about peace and love and protesting the war in Vietnam, and they were afraid their clientele would beat us up. So we went back to Oklahoma City, and there was a little coffee house called the Sword and Stone, and we just played there for fun, just to you know, play. And then Tom, didn't, we didn't know where we were going, so Tom went to Cleveland to hang out with his parents, and I stayed in Oklahoma City, and then I got a call from somebody, I forget who, wanting to know if we wanted to play some colleges in Wisconsin. So I called Tom, and he says, of course. So I flew to Cleveland, met up with him. We made it about 70 miles, and the engine blew up in his car. <laughs> we had to call his dad to come 
to come and rescue us. His dad wasn't too happy about his son uh, being a, a musician anyway, as opposed to a marine biologist, is what he'd been studying for in college. So we w- we ended up taking the Greyhound bus to Wisconsin and did uh, several shows, traveling by bus from from school to school. And uh, then while we were on that tour, we got a call from some friends in Kansas City. There was a club called the Vanguard Coffee House that we both had played as solos. And in fact, while we were still living in L.A., we flew back one time over Christmas and New Year's to, to play the Vanguard. And our opening act was Steve Martin, who was still working at Disneyland. And we just had a ball. We had a great two weeks hanging out with Steve. Now, did he play the banjo at all? Oh, gosh, yeah. Oh, I cool. Mean, you know what? It took 12 years after we first saw him at the Vanguard for America to catch up with his sense of humor. He was still doing exactly the same stuff. Fun <laughs> balloon animals and the nose glasses and the arrow through the head and playing banjo. He called himself just another... I'm just another banjo magic act. <laughs> Funny guy. There's a great anyway, picture of you and Steve Martin on your website. Uh, yeah, that would, that just yeah. happened last year. Yeah. Uh, the, the day after, I had a great, great compliment. I was uh, inducted into the Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame, my home state, which is a major, major uh, kudo for me. It was really an honor. Well deserved. Considering. Well deserved. Thank you. Yeah especially considering all the artists. My gosh, I had no idea how many artists had come from my home state, but a lot of Woody Guthrie, for God's sake, to begin with, and Leon Russell and many others. But you know what? I was in, The first band I was in in high school, a rock and roll band, was their guitar player was Jesse Ed Davis, who went on to play with, uh, gosh, the Beatles, Dylan, Taj Mahal, everybody. Wow. He ended up being like the guy, the session guy in L.A. for, uh, if you wanted to, a Strat, Stratocaster player, he was the guy. And years later, while Tom and I were recording one of our albums, one of the multiple record labels we were with, we were at Capitol at the time, we were recording an album called ST11261, and I just happened to run into him. He was coming off an elevator as I was getting on it. So he said, so we caught up. He said, man, you want to play on a couple of songs? I said, sure. So that was, that was great, having Jesse play on a couple of songs on that album. And if you want to know why we named it such a weird thing, We'd already been with a couple of record labels before that, and record company people, they don't even relate to it as music. To them, it's just product. And so we looked up what our album product manufacturing serial number (laughs) that you see on the edges of an old LP was going to be, and it was ST11261. So that's why we named that album ST11261. You want product? Here's product. Well, everybody from the ninth floor up at the Capitol Tower just loved it. I, so anyway, that's why I, I mean. I think Yes it. called their album 90125 for the same kind of reason. That was like I, that was like the next. So. I think that was the next serial number to be released by their label. So that's that's yeah. So, but you did it first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we've we've uh, like I said, this is our 52nd anniversary, and we've covered a lot of miles and crossed paths with a lot of people. If people go to our website, I mentioned earlier, there's, yeah. there's more information than anybody would want to know about brewership. No, actually, I loved your website because it had great stuff. In fact, um, I like the, the FAQs at the back where it says, you know, we, we do private events and this and that. And then one of the things is like, well, can, can I have you stay at our house to, to save money? It's like, no. <laughs> no, no, no. We need our motel room. <laughs> Got to have our space. You know, but I thought yeah, that was we, really cool. We, yeah. We have to have our own little corner of Mogadishu or Kandahar. <laughs> we got to have it. <laughs> so where were the cooler places that you've played, you know, and, and, you know, having traveled all over the place, what were the more memorable places? Like, like you had that great fly fishing story, for example. Um, what, what are the great stories you have of either connecting with people or jamming with other people or meeting people that you always wanted to play with or, we're seeing, you know, great parts of America that maybe well, you come across. Man, I tell you, it's kind of apples and oranges because we have been doing it for 52 years. That's just together. And we've crossed paths with lots of people. We've had so many shows with, you know, great artists. And dig this. At one point, Billy Joel opened for us. Oh, wow. Bruce Springsteen opened for us. Linda Ronstadt opened for us. How weird is that? That's cool. Now, did any of these people open for you at my father's place? Because all oh, of no. them, no, no, 
because because Linda Ronstadt played at my father's place. Bruce, the Bruce Springsteen band actually opened for the Paul Winter Consort way back in the day. Epi tells a great story. That, yeah. By the way, how did you guys meet Epi? Who met who? Uh, well, we met him the first time we played in my father's place. It was just a gig that was booked, you know, by who, whatever booking agent we were with at the time. And uh, yeah, when we were, you know, touring, gosh, we used to, well, after we left, let me back up a little okay. bit. I was telling you about the when we ended up doing colleges in Wisconsin, didn't know where we were going and everything. In the middle of that tour, we got a call from some friends in Kansas City who were affiliated with the Vanguard Coffee House that I mentioned, where Steve Martin and, and we played. And they were on the same page we were. They just thought, you know, they, they wanted to form a company, and they needed somebody with an album. So we just happened to have an album. And we were friends already anyway, and we liked Kansas City, so we didn't know where else we were going to go. So we, we moved to Kansas City to form a company called Good Karma Productions. And it was just, you know, you know, bootstrap, shoelace, you know, putting it together and everything. Nobody knew what they were doing. Forming a company and trying to book shows and stuff. And we ended up playing virtually every high school and college and junior college, not just in the Kansas City area, but surrounding states. And it ended up growing and growing to all over the heartland playing playing colleges. And it just, you know, continued to grow and grow. And then uh, we then we went to the east. We got out of our record deal with A&M because in those days, if you didn't live in L.A., Nashville, San Francisco, or New York, they didn't think you were in the business. Today, you can live anywhere you want to. You know, you can phone in your part or whatever, but not <laughs> in those days. So they thought we'd just quit and gone home. So we got out of all of our contracts. And the main thing we really wanted was to own our own songs because, you know, we got together as staff songwriters for a m so they own all those songs. So we formed our own publishing company, and uh, we went to the East Coast and landed another record deal with Buddha Kama Sutra. We did five albums for them. So we ended up playing, and then we recorded an album called Weeds, which is one of my favorites, actually. And uh, we ended up, you know, traveling all over the, the country and started and this is back in the days when FM radio was, was brand new. The uh, That's why they signed us, in fact, because FM was, was brand new, and it was called Underground Radio. And uh, Neil Bogart was the president of Buddha Kama Sutra, and he was, most, he was known as the Bubblegum King with hits like Yummy, 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 I've Got Love in My Tummy and stuff like that. So he wanted album artists, and we were album artists, so he signed us. And then we ended up recording Weeds and really developed a uh, cult following and getting FM airplay. And we started opening for larger, you know, bigger artists and just were really having a, a great time and just building a following. And then our next album was Tarkio, which, of course, had one toke over the line on it. And uh, we got a hit with that. And that just, we'd already been on the road forever. We, well, that meant we just continued to be on the road only playing bigger venues and headlining and, and getting paid more. So you ended up on Lawrence Welk at some point, because that was kind of a funny story to hear. Yeah, when One Choke was a hit, I should, it, I should say this too, uh, we, when we wrote One Choke Over the Line, we literally wrote it at the Vanguard Coffee House, in fact, just laughing. Tom and I, uh, some friends had stopped by, we were getting ready to go on for the last set of the evening, and we stepped out back and, and burned one. And uh, came back in, and Tom said, man, I'm really one toke over the line. And I just cracked up and started singing, one toke over the line, sweet Jesus. The next day we got together, and in about an hour turned it into a song, literally just to make our friends laugh. You know, we didn't take it seriously at all. It was just a lark. But the first time we played uh, Carnegie Hall, we opened for Melanie. And we went over really well and... Uh, basically ran out of songs, got a few encores, so we just thought, well, let's do that new song. We sang One Toke Over the Line. Everybody loved it, and the president of Buddha Kama Sutra, Neil Bogart, came backstage and said, oh, man, you got to record that. you got to add that to the album, which kind of surprised us, because like I said, we didn't even take it seriously. So we did. There's another story, because in those days, a single, they wanted to release it as a single, but a single could only be three minutes and ten seconds long. And there was a third verse to One Toke, so we had to edit it. And well, in those days, it wasn't digital technology, it was analog. We literally had to mark the master tape with chalk and cut it and hope we got it right. Otherwise, we would have had to re-record the whole song. 
So we edited it, and we got it pretty right. You could kind of hear a little bit of a skip, though. So we put a cymbal crash or something on it to mask it a little bit. And to this day, when I listen to it, I can still hear the splice. Nobody else does, but of course we do. Wow. So but well, it, it, then they released it as a single, and it went shooting up the charts, and we were in big trouble because of Richard Nixon. And Spiro Agnew. <laughs> oh, yeah, Spiro Agnew <laughs> named us personally one night on national TV as subversives to American youth because of one choke over the line. We made Nixon's enemies list, which we held as a badge of honor and still do to this day. And by the way, I wish he would was back. We miss him. We'd take Richard Nixon back in a heartbeat over this guy. Well, you don't have Richard Nixon to kick around anymore, but that's an old speech. We're out of time for this quick segment, but please keep up great stories with Michael Brewer. We'll be right back. I'm Roger. I'm Tom. And I'm Vic. And we're Blue Race. Race. And you're You're listening listening to Richard Richard Simon Simon on WCWE 88.1 FM. FM. All right, Richard Solomon, Michael Brewer, Brewer and Shipley, BrewerandShipley.com. By the way, if you go to their website, they got the coolest stuff. They got pictures, they got interviews, they got audio interviews, they got songs, all kinds of really neat stuff. They got a great history that just uh, is you rich. You can even listen to everything we've ever recorded free. Wow, that and you can't beat that. No, so, including so, bootleg things from my father's place. Right, now you said it had an interesting comment on your website, which is, uh, you know, on, on one... Uh, one part of your side as an artist like doesn't really want all your stuff being pirated because that interferes with your you know intellectual property. On the other hand, isn't it nice that people are preserving all this cool stuff? You know, how do you mediate between all that? Because it's like the the good news is your stuff is bootlegged, and the bad news is your stuff is bootlegged. Well, Richard, you know we have no control over all the bootleg stuff. My gosh, there's so much stuff out there. There are multiple albums, uh, you know, repackages and stuff that we had absolutely nothing to do with. I, we don't even know who released them or anything. And there's nothing we can do about it. But uh, I'm glad that, you know, the fans like to listen to the music. You know, that's really what it's all about. So, that, uh, you know, the fans like the music and they're still coming to our shows. And, uh, you know, we always, every single show we ever do, we always go out and sign autographs and sell T-shirts and CDs and stuff and have our pictures taken. And every single show, people tell us how much our music is meant to them. Over the years, it's been, it was a you know part of the fabric of their lives. Their kids have grown up listening to our music even. A lot of times it's their kids who show up with their parents' LPs for us to sign. You know? <laughs> and that warms my heart. It really does. But as far as the bootleg stuff is concerned, we have no control over that. You know, We do a show and somebody in the audience videotapes it. And before the show's over, it's on YouTube, for God's sake, without our consent. With you know, So we have no control over that. And we don't like that, but there's really nothing we can do about it. So switching gears back at least to the, the, the days of FM, do you remember the first time you were in a car or something and you actually heard yourself on the radio? As like oh, absolutely. All right, what, was that, what was that moment like when you were like, Well, wow, it wasn't that... just FM, yeah. When one, well, I heard, heard us on FM, yeah, with our Weeds album. Because like I said, that's why Buddha Commerce Sutra signed us. And we got a lot of FM airplay. That's you know, what really started uh, building our following. Oh, it was a rush because we were... We were traveling, again, back to what I was saying, you know, we were traveling the heartland out of Kansas City, playing colleges all over the Midwest. And uh, since it was colleges, it was almost always wintertime. And we were pretty much living the easy rider life, actually, because in the heartland at the time, there weren't a whole lot of people who looked like us. We kind of glowed in the dark. You know, we <laughs> just come from L.A. and uh, we're in you know, Nehru shirts and beads and things. And again, singing about peace and love and protesting the war in Vietnam. So we, we were turned away from many motels. Uh, you know, we had, to be, we had to pick and choose where we would stop to get gas or get something to eat because people wanted to hurt us. And, uh, yeah, we were kind of living the, the easy rider thing, and I, I lost my train of thought. Well, no, no you were just talking about, about FM and listening to yourself on FM. Oh, yeah. Um, it on is... FM. Oh, it was great. You know, and I really loved it when they, cause like I said, FM radio, the last thing you would hear would be somebody's hit single. It was, you know, all about album cuts or albums. Sometimes they would play whole albums. You know, and uh, gosh, in the, traveling all around the heartland, there there was a station out of Little Rock, Arkansas, called Beaker Street, a show called Beaker Street, hosted by a DJ named Clyde Clifford, and that thing must have had a huge output because we run into people up in the Dakotas, even all over the country, who used to listen to that show. 
but hearing a, a, a peyote chant that we, we put to music called Witchy Taito. And at the time, again, it would never be played as a single because the thing was like eight minutes long or something. Hearing that on the radio while we're driving through Nebraska or Iowa or something was was pretty damn cool. I have to say, it was it was really cool. So, the music that you write today, how does that? If you were to take a time machine and go back in time and talk to your younger self, what would you tell yourself as a younger person about the songwriting craft? You know, either the do's, the don'ts, or you know, in, you know, enjoy the, the the more you know the less technological uh, aspects of recording. What would you? What would you? What would you, how would you? How would you reflect on all of that? Well, it's kind of a double-edged sword, you know, because people, you know, trying to earn a living making music, especially if you have a record deal, you know, hopefully you write something that people are going to like that has some kind of commerciality to it. But uh, gosh, it's been literally twenty-five years since I've even thought about writing a song for commerciality. It's all about just as an artist expressing myself, and Tom feels the same way, you know. Who cares if it's a hit or not? You know, we just write. Well, actually, Tom and I haven't written a song together in really quite a while. But uh, I'm more prolific now than, than I've ever been. And my whole style of writing is, has really changed. It used to be, you know, we'd sit around and play guitar and, uh, you know, come up, play a groove and a melody would develop and somebody, you know, would come up with a line or something or, or maybe even had an idea when we started writing something. But now then, something pops into my head and I just become obsessed with it. I write the whole song in my head. I even hear it produced with, you know, harmony vocals or instrumentation or whatever. And it might be a couple of years before I even sit down with my guitar and pick a key and see if I can play what I hear. I kind of feel like I have a radio in my head all the time, and sometimes I turn it up do, and do, pay attention. Are you ever, uh, for, are you ever afraid you're going to forget it? Oh, no, I, when I write the lyrics, I always put it, put it down on paper okay. and put it in the computer. But, uh, you know, I have so many songs that, have, that I've never recorded or never, probably never will. Because, you know, I mean, as, you're, as I'm writing them, I realize this isn't the best song I've ever written, but I'm, I'm obsessed. You know, it's like a painter, for instance. You know, a painter paints lots of pictures, and at the time probably doesn't think that, you know, this is going to be a masterpiece a lot of times or whatever. But you just can't help it anyway as an artist. You know, it's just something coming out, expressing your thoughts and feelings. So, so if you could sneak into a concert incognito, just, just a member of the general public. Who would you like to see today? Who's still out there? Oh, man. You know, I'm, you, not, you know, I'm not real sure. I mean, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of geezers like us, you know. That are I wouldn't say, you, when I listen to you guys, I don't see geezers. I mean, I don't. Well, thank you, know. you very much. Well, we, we, you know, in our hearts and souls and spirits, you know, we're still in our 20s, but we're actually, physically, we're in our 70s. So <laughs> what can I tell you? It, it gets harder. But I was going to say, to, you, to answer your question about what would I tell young songwriters today, it's double-edged sword. You're wanting to you know, get recognized, so you're thinking about commerciality. But I would have to say, go with your heart. You know, Just write what you feel and what you think. And Because we have found in our career, lots of people hear that and go, oh, my God, I'm not alone. There are other people out there. I've had many, many people, especially back in the day, say that, you know, they little towns in the heartland or wherever, you know, they could feel like they were a stranger in a strange land, you know, and like just nobody, they didn't know anybody who felt the way they did or had the same kind of thoughts they had pertaining to spirituality or politics or whatever. And they would hear our, one of our albums and go, oh my God, there are other people out there who feel like that. So, so you know, that's, and that's all Tom and I were doing. We were just writing songs that expressing our thoughts and feelings, you know politically, socially, social commentary. And a lot of that came because we were folk singers. We started out in the folk era, playing coffee houses. And, you know, that's what folk music traditionally has always been about, is social commentary. My gosh, it used to be the news for a lot of people. People, you know, writing songs about what's going on and wherever, you know, Selma, Alabama, and then they'd go on to Atlanta or whatever, you know, and sing songs. And that's, it was literally the news to a lot of people way back when. Who were your folk singer heroes growing up? Well, uh, certainly uh, Woody Guthrie, and then Bob Dylan came along and, you know, totally blatantly, uh, admittedly copying Woody Guthrie. I was a big Bob Dylan fan. Uh, so many folk artists, you know, good grief. Fred Neal is one of my all-time favorites. He's one of the first guys who started writing his own songs and incorporating an electric guitar or bass or drums or something. 
he may be the inventor of folk rock for all I know. Yeah, but Fred Neal, like gosh, back in the folk days, I used to do so many Fred Neal songs in my set. It was unbelievable, as did many other people. The first time I met David Crosby, he was a folk singer. I met him at a uh, coffee house in Omaha, Nebraska, and just about every song he did was a Fred Neal song. He dressed like Fred <laughs> Neal. He played a 12-string guitar like Fred Neal. First time I met uh, Yorma Kalkinen and, and Paul Kantner, founding members of the Jefferson Airplane. Oh, yeah. They were folkies. I mean, I have an old picture of uh, Paul Kantner in the early 60s, ironing clothes, wearing a white button-down collar shirt, big horn rim glasses with a flat-top haircut when he was a banjo player. Tom and I played, uh, Yorma has this great guitar camp in southern Ohio, and a couple of years ago we, we played there, just had a ball. And uh, he told me that they had never touched an electric guitar until they formed uh, Jefferson Airplane. Oh, wow. Yeah. Same thing goes with the Grateful Dead. You know, Jerry Garcia was a folky. Oh, yeah. The John Mother McCrees. Mother McCrees, yeah. Sure, yeah. John Sebastian, The Love and Spoonful. They were folkies. And it was just a new form of music, you know, plugging in and writing your own songs. And Dylan plugged in and freaked everybody out at the Newport Folk Festival. But I guess it didn't matter much because look at him now. So, so why? Now I have to say, too, that we ended up years later getting to record with some of the very people who played on bringing it all back home and, and his, his early, you know, Highway 61 revisited and stuff. Michael Bloomfield, for instance. What an honor. We, we've just been blessed to get to work with so many really talented musicians. Al Cooper, same thing. So why Al is... Al Cooper it? played on, uh, on two songs on our ST, 11261 album, in fact. I haven't seen him in years, but the last time I ran into him, at, at the time, he was saying, you know, I really should be playing organ on this song instead of piano, and piano on this song instead of organ. <laughs> Years went by when I ran into him on the road someplace. He brought that up. He said, I still think I should have played piano or organ on that one. I heard a little story, too. When we were working with him, he was producing, uh, oh, gosh, I'm brain dead. Sweet Home Alabama. What's the band? Leonard Skinner. What's the, what's the band who did Sweet Home Alabama? Leonard Skinner. Yeah, yeah Leonard yeah. Skinner. Yeah, he was producing them. And he says, listen to this. So we were one of the first people in the studio to hear Sweet Home Alabama. And it blew us away. It was the hottest recording we'd ever heard. I mean, it was like, you know, he, he pushed the envelope as the, you know, the EQ and stuff, what you could do. Because a lot of engineers would go, you can't do that. Well, that, you know, that's what people do, pushing the envelope and come up with new sounds and stuff. So, so yeah, that was pretty cool hearing that in the studio. So why isn't all of this great stuff somewhere on that website? All these great pictures and all this great... You need like a little digital museum, the extra section on your website. Of all, all these great photos, all these great you know, little stories. I mean, you got a lot of great stuff up there, but it seems like, you know, just even talking to you, I've just tapped, you know, <laughs> it's like there's a lot of oil underneath the ground. I just got like, you know, a little squirt. Like I'm like Jim well, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> at, at the time, you know, you're just working, you know, you're just in the studio working, you know, or you're on the road on a tour or whatever, and other people are taking the photos. So, you know, you just can't capture everything. Although there are some, some photos on our website of uh, with us, you know, in the studio with Michael Bloomfield and John Kahn and Mark Naflin and, you know, a lot of different people. Mark Naflin, by the way, I'm still in touch with him. He was just inducted last year into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. For his, uh, you know, being in uh, Dire Straits. No, no, not Dire Straits. Uh, Paul Butterfield Blues Band. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah, they were great too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so have you amassed a very big um, recording collection over the years? You mean uh, just records? Yeah, you know, LPs, CDs, cassettes. You know. Well, yeah, but uh, in 2012, like I'll go back. You know, where my wife and I live in in southern Missouri in the Ozarks. So does Tom, and he's about three hours away. Uh, have you heard of Branson, Missouri? Sure have, yes. Yeah, the world's largest roadside oddity, is what <laughs> I call it. doesn't have anything to do with the music business I've always been in. But anyway, the country is beautiful, and I've lived here for 31 years now. Uh, dang it. Richard, I just lost my train of thought. We're talking about the big collection of music you can oh, mass yeah, yeah, over yeah. the years. In yeah. 2012, a freak tornado came through on Leap Day, oh, February, wow. of all things, and took our house out. Oh, We're lucky no. to be breathing. Yeah, my wife woke up about 1.30 in the morning and took just like strobe light, lightning. And she got up to turn off the computer and turn on the TV just to hear him say, you know, if you live 
right where we live. You need to take cover immediately. So I was sound asleep. She ran down and shook me. She didn't quite make it to our bathroom. Something knocked her down. I made it about six feet, and the ceiling caved in on me as the roof went flying. And we just huddled in the door well of our bathroom. I just kind of got on top of her, trying to keep us from getting sucked out, looking at open sky. And uh, we survived it. And what was left of our house had to be bulldozed down, so we had to rebuild from scratch. So we're living in a whole new, whole new place. You know, you've had a couple of close brushes with the Grim Reaper. <laughs> is, is there a yeah. song in there about that? <laughs> you know? Oh, more than more than one. <laughs> So, well, don't we all? You know, we all dodge bullets every day, whether we, we hear them whiz by or not. So what what would you like to tell all those people out there who come to the shows? What, what would you like to tell them through our little radio program here? I mean, you, you t- t- for me, the music is such a rich body of American, you know, greatness, uh, history, depth. Uh, you know, listening to you guys, you can just close your eyes. It's just so easy to listen to. I love the stories that you tell on stage, you know, the five record labels and all the other stuff that you talk uh-huh. about. Um, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's so wonderful that you are who you are and you're still doing it. And you still do it with uh, class and, and, and just heart. You guys have a lot of heart. Thank um, you. And, and authenticity. You know, that, well, that's, I would tell them to love each other. All right. and, and don't give up hope. It could, it, personally, though, if it wasn't for false hope, I'd have no hope at all. This <laughs> stage <of my> life. <laughs> but no, love each other, treat each other well. Uh, you know, go by the golden rule, man. Treat other people the way you wish to be treated, and don't give up hope. And for what, no matter what you do, get off your asses and vote. Yes, it's always good. To, so, in the last minute that we have. What's it like living where you live? Is it is it very rural? Is it very very serene? It's, it's very rural. I mean, everybody who comes here thinks that we really live in the boondocks, but it really isn't. I mean, there's a lot of woods, you know, in the Ozarks. And uh, my wife Scarlett and I live about on a bluff, about 200 feet above a lake, and uh, just right down, just to the right of us a little bit. I'm looking at it right now. Actually, the very power side dam, the very first dam built west of the Mississippi River, is still generating electricity. It's very rural, but it's it's not as the boondocks as you think, because you know you're driving around. There are roads everywhere. There are houses everywhere. So it, it's not it's not nearly as much as the boondocks as people might think, because uh, there are just people everywhere, and a lot of wildlife though, and 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 uh, waterfowl, and just it's just gorgeous. You know, I love it. The weather leaves a lot to be desired. It's been extremely hot and humid lately, but overall, it's just a it's just a beautiful beautiful place because Tom and I never want to live in a city again that's why we moved here a long time ago back in the 70s and it's just uh yeah it's, it's a very rural setting we're blessed to have the view we have I'm looking at it right now I'm sitting on the deck and uh looking at the moon shining on the lake and it's very peaceful I'm listening to the cicadas and uh it inspires a lot of songs I think that's awesome yeah, yeah. I have five solos by the way uh my first one was an LP produced by my friend Dan Fogelberg. And uh, then I have four independently released CDs of my rants and raves. And you can also find out how to purchase those through our website. And I'm just going to keep doing it uh, until somebody, we're going to keep doing it until somebody just tells us we can't do it anymore. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to always encourage you to keep doing it because I think you guys are awesome. Let me, well, let me do this. We're going to close out the show here, but I want to talk to you for a little bit uh, afterwards. So, for those out there, this is a phenomenal show. If you missed the beginning, we'll stick it up on uh, My Father's Place Radio and on WCWP.org and a lot of other great places. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.